to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 121st episode, our returning guest is Leon Nafok. Leon Nafok is a staff writer at Slate Magazine and the host of Slow Burn. He was previously a writer for the Ideas section of the Boston Globe and the New York Observer. He is the author of The Next Next Level, a story of rap, friendship, and almost giving up. And now on to the show. Hello? Leon. Hey, what's up? Hey, uh, I uh, I wanted to say, Leon, pick up the fucking phone, but I don't feel like I know you like that, but just know that I wanted to make that <laughs> reference. When you did the juice box video? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. You went deep. Oh, I went all the way in, so. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's like, uh, you know that guy Nardwar? Mm-hmm. It's like a, that's like Nardwar level. That's a pretty good level to be at. If I could be somewhere between there and Terry Gross, I'd be fine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, congratulations for topping the iTunes charts. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank that's, you very much. Yeah, well-deserved. Um, and uh, when we, you know, talked about coming back on, and I, I give, first of all, appreciate you, uh, you know, taking time out of your very busy schedule to... No, no, it's my pleasure. ...be back on, for sure. Um, but you said you were very much in the shit, and I can totally understand <laughs> that. So how are you feeling these days? Uh, well, I mean, so, you know, we are, we just put out the third episode out of eight, um, and, you know, we'll probably be, uh, we'll probably be making little last changes to, to the last one, like, the night before it comes out, uh, realistically. I mean, that's how, that's how it was last week, last year, third, last season, too. Um, mm-hmm. but, you know, you kind of, I think you kind of take, you get, you end up filling whatever time you give yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope uh, as far as it'll go in terms of deadlines. Um, you know, I think with this with this season, um, we bumped into challenges that we didn't have last season, so that like slowed us down a little bit, especially near the near the beginning of the process. We had some false starts and had some ideas for like the first episode that didn't pan out. Um, but we're we're like in pretty good shape. You know, we 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 have. We have five more to release. We're, you know, we're in, we're like in striking distance on two of them, and uh, that leaves three uh, to be uh, to, to still be written. But um, I don't know. I feel like the the last three are a lot easier than the than the first three. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I just from listening to the difference between season one and season two, you're obviously covering. You're, you're really not covering one scandal with with the Clintons. It's just it's it's yeah. it's just this like. Uh, what's that uh, rat king like where all the tails get <laughs> together and whatever that is like it's just like there's so many heads on this it's it's amazing because like you know we lead of course to the Lewinsky scandal eventually but that was you know we're talking about Whitewater and all these other things like that just get you know it's amorphous you know yeah I mean uh, you know I sort of didn't quite appreciate the extent to which that would turn out to be the case until we really started reading about how the Lewinsky scandal came about, um, you know, and, and, and initially when, when I was telling people that we were doing Clinton for the second season, I would make this, you know, people would say, oh, so you're, you know, you're doing Lewinsky. Uh, and I would make this joke and I would say, oh, no, no, I think we're just going to focus on the really fun scandal, uh, Whitewater. <laughs> um, but I, I made that joke sort of not realizing that, you know, in order to explain how, um, how things got to the point where they had to be, how, in order to explain how things got, in order to explain how the Lewinsky scandal came about, you really have to kind of take, you know, follow the threads back to, uh, you know, the beginning of the, well, really to the, to the, to the 92 campaign. Um, and that's why, you know, the structure that we went with, uh, you know, kind of, uh, we ended up pulling back um, for episodes two and three, um, and 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 you know revisiting or sort of excavating the the, the scandals that, that preceded Lewinsky, and then kind of laid the groundwork for it for, for for that uh, situation to explode. Um, I didn't really have an appreciation for for how connected all those things were. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even heard of Travelgate, but you know, yeah. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was a travel gate that that, that 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 led to you know Vince Foster's suicide, which in turn led to you know Whitewater getting kind of uh, new attention in the press, which in turn led to the special prosecutor being uh, appointed. Um, I didn't know that uh, the Paula Jones lawsuit was like the vehicle through which 
you know, the the the, the accusations of perjury and obstruction, uh, or uh, you know, or the, sorry, let me let me rephrase that. Um, I didn't appreciate that that the Paula Jones lawsuit was sort of the reason uh, there was any perjury or obstruction to speak of. Um, mm-hmm. So learning all that, you know, was super interesting and and and, and made me realize that we, you know, in order to explain. How we got to the impeachment, um, you really got to go all the way back. So, as you say, yeah, there's like instead of one scandal, there's there's like a dozen, um, which made it a, a heavier lift in terms of research and reporting. What was Gate Gate? You remember that one? Gate Gate? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Was there a Gate Gate? There was a Gate Gate. I don't remember. I, I just remember it was always where people would be like, and there was Travel Gate, and there was Trooper Gate, and there was Gate Gate, and that was oh, always, man. I, I never really like, questioned it. I was, I was like, oh okay, there's a Gate Gate. I, I guess. Gate. <laughs> I, I, I heard there's something with the gate, gate of the White House. I don't know exactly. Well, there was, <laughs> I mean, I wonder if it's referring to. I'm just guessing here, but there was an incident. Um, I could Google I it, but it's more fun to speculate. <laughs> yeah, I forget the date of the incident, but uh-huh. uh, basically, like, Lewinsky was really desperate to see the president, um, and she felt sort of like he was putting her on the ropes and um, keeping her, you know, keeping her at arm's length, and she wanted to drop off presents for him. Hmm. Um, so she went to, to, to the, I think, the, I think it was the, the Northeast Gate, Northwest Gate, I can't hmm. remember exactly which gate it was, but anyway, she... she um, you know, she told the Secret Service agents there that, that she needed to see Betty Curry, who was Clinton's uh, personal secretary. And uh, Betty Curry told the Secret Service that she was busy and she couldn't come out for a little bit. Um, and so Lewinsky was waiting there um, at the gate uh, for, for Betty Curry. And in the meantime, she overheard one of the Secret Service agents mention something to, I think, you know, just to one of his colleagues uh, about Eleanor Mondale, uh, who was a sort of very famously beautiful, a very famous and famously beautiful um, TV anchor, I believe, news anchor, um, and the daughter of uh, of Walter Mondale. And um, I guess she was visiting the White House that day and then was spending time with Clinton. And Lewinsky interpreted that to mean that he was uh, involved with her and she became extremely upset irritated and, you know, caused a big scene Mm -hmm. that Clinton then yelled at her for on the phone saying, like, you can't do this, you know. Um, And so maybe that's gate gate. It might be. (laughs) It might be, yeah. It sounds good to me. (laughs) But uh, Bill Clinton has always seemed like a very self-sabotaging person. Um, You know, the the Republicans to this day, I mean, we had on the the day that Paul Manafort uh, gets, you know, found guilty on eight counts and Michael Cohen, you know, pleads guilty. Uh, we have lock her up still being chanted these to this day and it's just amazing like but he keeps handing them cudgels to beat him with like he's just like giving them everything like to you know what have you what what's your impression of of bill clinton's because he's a great he's a masterful politician he's a great public speaker i've seen him speak twice i've i've, I've shook his hand once um twice he said i had a good hat the second time um, but um but you know he's he's an incredibly smooth person and, but like he just seems like he's just he can't stop shooting himself in the foot. Yeah, I think that's right. And and uh, you know Ruth, Mar- Ruth Marcus from the Washington Post uh, said something along those lines to us for for episode two um, when she was talking about that first year uh, in which the Clintons were just like buffeted by scandal um, left and right. And um, you know her, her read on it was that. They just, you know, the Clinton administration, partly out of, you know, a lack of experience, partly out of, um, you know, partly out of their perhaps status as outsiders in Washington, they kept just falling into one trap after another. Um, or maybe that's not, 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 not fair to say that, but they kept, they kept, you know, they kept mis- having one misstep after another. I think those were her exact words. Um, but, uh, you know, his, his political enemies were all too happy to seize on those missteps and mm-hmm. take advantage of them. So, I mean, to your point, like, the affair with Lewinsky 
happened against the backdrop of the Paula Jones sexual harassment lawsuit, you know, which was exactly about the same kind of behavior where, you know, yeah. as as a public official, Clinton, you know, made advance and made an advance on a on a subordinate. You know, it's just like it's just unspeakably reckless, right? And mm-hmm. it's sort of impossible to, to to guess or exactly what he was thinking. But um, you know, I think he has said you know, in the few in the few comments he has made publicly about why he did this. I think these comments came around the time of his book tour when he when he published My Life. Mm. You know, I think he said something like, "I did this for the worst possible reason, which is that I could." Mm. Um, which I don't think goes all the way to explaining it, but um, you know, yeah, he's he's just he seems like a like a guy who couldn't help himself. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. Um, and he certainly and he certainly must have been aware on some level that like uh, he was he was doing something very dangerous, especially because there were so many um, people in his orbit trying, you know, trying to take him down and looking for any possible lever to pull in which, with which mm-hmm. to do that. And, you know, to, to, to commit this indiscretion was, was just a really, um, seemed to be like kind of playing into their hands. Mm-hmm. But why do you think the Republicans still hate the Clintons so much? Like, what is it about them that just gets their goat? Because you pointed this out, or, you know, I think you quoted someone else as saying he could talk to 12 people and each one would yeah. think that he's, like, talking specifically to them. Like, he's very good at that triangulation, third way, you know, making your idea my idea, mm-hmm. you know, that that whole thing. But why do they hate him so much? Because it seems like he's willing to do whatever they want. I mean, the 94 crime bill, perfect example, you know. Yeah, so I, I actually didn't have uh, as much of an appreciation as I probably should have for, for just how, um, you know, aggressively centrist he was and how, how willing he was to embrace, you know, policies uh, that would appeal to conservatives. Um, he, you know, was not like a super liberal president um, in a lot of ways. I mean, he was, you know, ironically, he was, or, you know, I don't know if ironically is the right word, but no, no, notably, he was, you know, very good on women's issues. He was, you know, very, uh, very liberal on, on abortion and, and stuff like that. But um, he put Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, with welfare reform, with the crime bill... I just crossed myself when you said Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the crime bill, with the, with the, with the welfare reform, um, you know, he was willing to, to kind of enact policies that would make him popular with, with conservatives. You know, I interviewed Ann Coulter um, for this podcast, and, and she, she was, I asked her, like, why did you guys hate him so much? And she said, look, it wasn't about his policies. Like, God, if I had a Democratic, if we had a Democratic president with his policies, we'd kiss his feet. It wasn't his policies. It was that he was a liar. And we felt like he just was getting away with all these lies for so long. And that was what made us so angry. Hmm. Um, so I think that was, I think that, I, 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 I don't know how much of that is showmanship on her part in saying that, but, um, hmm. but I think that, I think that, goes a long way towards explaining it. I think from the very beginning, he and Hillary were seen as um, cagey, as, as secretive, as, as being like, um, you know, kind of willing to, to, to engage in legalist, legalistic kind of moral reasoning um, in order to to please people instead of um, mm. actually doing the right thing. Um, I think that's, you know, I... I, I I, I, I don't feel qualified really to say how fair that is, but um, but I think that was the the heart of it. It was that he he, he came across to, to to people on the right as a person without character, as a person with like a very malleable um, sort of moral center. Hmm. Um, and I think the Lewinsky thing just played into that, right? Like it's, in the same way that um, in the same way that so many of his missteps played into that image. You know, like the, I I I. I, and hey, I tried smoking weed, but I didn't inhale. You know, it's such a, it's a so there's something so like kind of. Um, have you uh, have you read Christopher Hitchens' book, No One Left to Lie To, about Bill Clinton? No, I haven't read it. I haven't oh, read it's, it. it's a good one. Anyway, he was at Oxford at the same time as as Bill Clinton. Is that right? I didn't know that. He has it on 
good authority that the reason that he was able to get away with that line is that he ate a marijuana brownie, and therefore, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Could legally say that he didn't. But anyhow, um, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, you touch in this season and in last season about uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, they, they really circle both of these water, you know, Watergate and uh, well, just the Clintons in general. Um, so just talk a little bit about some of the conspiracy theories that are out there. I'm sure uh, you, you talked about them being accused of being murderers. They're uh, accused of you know any man any manner of, of things. Uh, you know, flying drugs into Mena, Arkansas. Yeah. Um, all the like what what do you make of that so so i'll be honest with you i haven't like dived dove i haven't dove uh super deep into the conspiracy waters on clinton i mean i i i got in deep enough to know uh that you know there was a cottage industry around vince foster's death that that purported to you know point out inconsistencies in his in the in the in the uh, in the park where he was found, um, you know whether he had the gun in his right hand or the left hand, or, uh, you know whether there was enough whether there was enough blood uh, around his body when he was discovered. Um, people really uh, people really went all in on that, and and and, and I think Clinton's political enemies, um, including like Jerry Falwell, who bankrolled uh, the Clinton Chronicles, the mm. quasi documentary that. Mm-hmm. Uh, very famously accused them of being murderers and drug dealers and whatnot, mm-hmm. as you were alluding, alluding to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, the, uh, to me, the sort of the interesting question with that stuff is always like, to what extent do the people who are propagating this stuff really believe in it? You know, mm-hmm. believe in it, and to what extent are they just being kind of propagandists? Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, there are people who believe it. You know, who watch that stuff and believe it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I'm always curious, like whether the people who are Putting it out there and 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 you know com- con you know and and uh, kind of, uh, the people who are signal boosting it um, mm-hmm. from positions of authority or positions of prominence, whether they believe it or whether they're just you know doing it because they know it'll help their their cause. Um, I think the Clintons' uh, inclination towards secrecy kind of. Um, Encourages that kind of thinking, perhaps. Um, you know, there, uh, one thing about season one that I think you and I talked about last time was that there a lot of felt like there were a lot of parallels to the present. Um, mm-hmm. With this season, there's less of that. But one, 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 the one parallel that I did detect, and, and I, I hope this came through a little bit in the episode, uh, in episode two. But, you know, one of the big controversies regarding Whitewater. Um, so Whitewater was sort of this multi multi tentacled controversy that included a bunch of little subplots that were only kind of tangentially related to each other. But one of them was about these billing records that that um, were supposed to show what kind of work Hillary Clinton did for uh, the failed savings and loan bank that was operated by the you know the Clintons' co investor in White in the Whitewater land development. So mm-hmm. it's already so convoluted. Um, that was like a, too long of a sentence, but just re- goes to show you how convoluted this is. But basically, I'm going to try this again. Hillary Clinton did some legal work for Madison Guarantee, which was a savings and loan bank in in Little Rock that uh, James Jim McDougal, who was who one of the Clintons co who was one of the Clintons co investors in, in Whitewater, operated. And the billing records were missing, uh, or at least they were purported to be missing um, when investigators requested the billing records to see what kind of legal work Hillary had done for the savings and loan bank. The answer was, like, we don't have them. Sorry. So these missing billing records, which eventually were discovered, um, kind of became this perfect, you know, black hole for conspiracy theorists because they could project anything they wanted onto them. They could say, well, why is it that they want so badly to conceal them? Why is it that they, um, you know, what are they hiding? Um, and, you know, when I mentioned that there's a parallel, it really reminds me of the emails controversy, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, where are the emails? What do they say? What is it? What is so important that they are going to such great lengths to, to prevent people from looking at them? Um, and I think that, I think that, I think that's a, that's a useful uh, thing for conspiracy theorists when there's something missing, when there's something uh, you, you can just speculate about. Um, mm-hmm. I think the Clintons probably 
did not do themselves any favors by by being as cagey as they were about some of the stuff that that people were asking about. That said, like you know, as Jane Sherburn, one of the um, one of the people I interviewed, she worked in the, worked in the White House Council. As Jane Sherburn told me, uh, it's not a, it's not at all self evident that you know putting all the putting everything out on the lawn and letting people dig through it would have been any better because um, it's you know it's entirely possible that the Clinton's political enemies would have um, would have been able to make hay out of out of stuff that they discovered in those files mm-hmm. right right now I'm assuming that the Clintons have turned you down for an interview yeah so I haven't heard back from them oh um, really hmm. well I mean I, I wouldn't <laughs> take that as a I wouldn't I don't think that means they oh, haven't oh, you should tell them it's for that James Patterson book <laughs> well actually I did I mean when I I, mean, I didn't I didn't tell them it was for the James Patterson book but I, but I did reach out to, to, to Bill Clinton's uh, representatives when the James Patterson book was out uh-huh. I was like hey I, I I, it was right, right after Clinton did the did the interview where he talked about me too, yeah. um, and I just kind of emailed them and was like, "Hey, it's like just following up on my request from earlier. Like, I I see that he's doing press. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you know there's any chance that you might have time to talk. Um, I'd love to tell you about the project, um, but I never heard back. So, mm-hmm. well, uh, you said at the beginning of the first episode that you were not able to secure an interview with Monica. That's right. Okay. So that hasn't changed. It's not changed. Uh, are there any other surprise guests? Can you tell us? Uh, there, there are oh, there are some good ones. Coming I knew, up, but... I knew it. <laughs> I knew <laughs> it. I'm I not going to tell you who they are. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so I'm not a guest. Yeah, you got your own podcast. I guess you can interview <laughs> whatever. Um, so, how does it feel to read ads as a journalist? <laughs> Oh, uh, that's a funny question. Are you asking that based on uh, the ad uh, the ads I've read so far on the season? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you know, hey, that's that's the game, right? I mean, that's that's what you do these days. And I think people understand when there's like, you know, how Sam Harris. If you ever listen to his podcast, he's always like, I don't want to have to, you know, say anything in front of every anybody. And it's like, I think it's like okay if you help recommend Hello Fresh or whatever. <laughs> it's like I don't care, Sam Harris. It's fine. Like I still respect to your, your mind or whatever you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna think you're uh, violating your out. ethics you know yeah so I mean what do you think about so, that? so I mean like there's something really um, kind of old-fashioned right about the about the host read as yeah a, as a, as a Texaco theater <laughs> What is that? Texaco theater. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you just imagine like the um, you imagine like the, the the talk show host like holding up a you know bottle of Tide or whatever and like <laughs> talking about how much how much the guy loves Tide. Uh-huh. Um, you know, pretty much literally what we're doing. But uh, you know, I did a host. I did a read. Uh, I did an ad read uh, for this for the third episode uh, for a, for a meal kit company called called mm-hmm. Gobble. Um, not not trying to advertise them right now, but uh, <laughs> not, not without know, a was, cut for the Rob Berger show. You're exactly. Not. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I will say, you know, like I was lucky in that when I tried their product, like I actually sincerely liked it, and so I was mm-hmm. not. I didn't find myself having to like say things that I didn't, that I felt were untrue, or like you know, rep for something that that I felt like our listeners would actually be disappointed by. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that helps. You know, I get I get it. You know, when we get an advertiser who's interested, we get an email. Saying like you know, do you approve? Um, do you approve this ad? Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this. I, I did get one ad request uh, from this company called Hims, which like they they make um, like hair 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 growth stuff and and mm. uh, erectile dysfunction medication. Mm. Uh, and I was kind of like, you know, I just don't think, I just don't think this is right for this show. Um, I just can't imagine these ads like having any effect other than to make people giggle, you know. And it's, you know, we're dealing with some heavy stuff in this, in this, in this season. We don't want to like, we don't want to like ruin the, you know, ruin the atmosphere, ruin the, the mood, yeah. um, so violently by like sure. having this like giggly ad about. Uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, mm. like, I remember there was like even jokes when when Caliphate had ads about from like I think it was ZipRecruiter or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, people were on Twitter were like joking around about how it was funny to hear ads for recruit for recruitment uh, company uh, in the context of a podcast about ISIS uh, and how ISIS recruits 
uh, people, you know, and I was like, huh, you know, if that, if that was enough to get people to, to giggle, I think this, I think this, this is probably a, a no for us. So, so we, I had to, I had to pass on that. Um, you know, but, but generally there's not that much, there's not, there's not really an issue. Right. I think, I think it's, it's interesting because like when I listen to like the Savage Love cast, for example, and I hear Dan Savage read an ad, he comes from the newspaper world. So he makes sure to have a hard stop between him answering the last question and him like starting the ad. But there's people like Mark Marin where they're like in the middle of a story and they'll just start. And I don't know, is this an ad yet? Okay. Then this is an ad <laughs> and there's no differentiation. But I think people who come from, it's funny because people who come from journalism, actually, they, they're like in their mind, they're like, okay. Stop right here. Pause. And now we're into it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I think you know I think different shows deal with it yeah. in different ways. Oh, like for sure. Have music that plays under the ads. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. You know, what what you're listening to. Yeah, for um, sure. But I think generally, like at this point, listeners are pretty savvy about. Um, you know, what's what. For so. sure. Um, okay, so we didn't talk about your book. I alluded to it earlier last time, uh, but I have, oh, yeah. I have read it. It's been a while, but I, I remember most of it. Um, I guess if I could only just ask one thing about it, I would just say, yeah. like, what does Juicebox think of it now, the fact that he was the star of this book and that he has been immortalized in this way? <laughs> uh, what does he think about it now? I don't know what he thinks about it now. Um, oh, I haven't spoken to him in a, in a bit. Um you know, at the time when it came out, he definitely had mixed feelings about it. Um, I would say mixed, mixed to negative, mixed to negative feelings about it. Um, for for totally understandable reasons, you know, it was like a really, you know, the, the book was, the book was called the Next Next Level, and it was it was billed as a you know part biography of this guy. Uh, that I kind of grew up idolizing, uh, you know, and, be, and befriending in adulthood. Um, Juicebox is, you know, this sort of experimental punk rapper, basically from from Wisconsin, um, and who who just meant a whole lot to me, and who kind of represented a lot of things for me. And he, when he moved to he moved to New York City uh, to try to kind of take one big swing at at, at you know advancing his music career. Um, you know, as he was sort of approaching age 30 and wondering how long he could really get away with doing it. Um, and I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time hanging out with him when he moved and I spent a lot of time thinking about him. And so the book is this very, you know, kind of, so it's a real, it's a real extreme close up on him. And it's also, and I think this part bothered him possibly even more. Uh, it's also kind of a close up on me. Um, you know, it's as much a biography of him as it is a memoir for, by, about me. Um, because it is about the, the relationship between a fan and an artist. The relationship I did like the a, scene near the beginning where he comes over to your apartment first time and you're like, hey guys, this is Juicebox. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that made me laugh. That was funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so I think like he didn't necessarily, he didn't necessarily, he didn't have control over how I portrayed him. That was one thing. Sure. I think that, that was hard for him. And, and again, mm-hmm. understandably, um, it must be really weird to have someone write a book about you. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it also must be really weird to have someone write a book about you in which you are sort of a vehicle for, for the author's, uh, you know, self-discovery or self, you know, self-reflection or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that made him, I think that made him feel like, uh, the book was not really about him, but it was really about me and how I saw him. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we had a couple of pretty, pretty tense conversations about it, um, I forget what what the what the radio station was. I think it was a Canadian radio station that booked us both at the same time and mm-hmm. sort of set us up to, to kind of have this little confrontation on the air that was really pretty intense. Um, where he kind of you know kind of accused me of, of using him, uh, hmm. which you know I think like that's it's not a totally uncommon reaction on the part of you know, subjects, you know, journalistic subjects. Um, it's a really weird relationship, you know, the relationship between a journalist and a subject. And, uh, I think it gets weirder when it's someone who you, you know, who you see as a friend and, uh, you know, I think the, I think the other thing was like, he couldn't control how I portrayed him, but then he really couldn't control how like reviewers portrayed him and their, when they wrote about the book. Um, and so I think a lot of the reviewers maybe didn't have quite as, you know, as much a nuanced view of him as I think I have and tried to express in the book. Like, 
whereas I kind of write about him as someone who makes music that is perhaps hard to love um, for most people, but but is in my view like original and exciting and uh, you know worth 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 sort of trying to understand. Uh, I think a lot of reviewers are like Juice Box, like worst rapper ever, you know stuff like that. Um, and that couldn't have been easy. So, so to answer your question, like I don't know how he feels about it now. At the time, he 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 was definitely like struggling with aspects of it. Um, but even then, he he I think you know he was conscious of the fact that it was kind of a, a, just a, a really strange thing that had happened to him that would probably settle in his memory differently than um, you know, and, and it, it would sort of settle in his it would sort of settle uh, in his mind, and perhaps he'd feel differently about it later. Um, Anyway, and it's not like we're you know we're we're not like not speaking. We you know mm-hmm. we've exchanged emails and stuff. I've sent him music that I like and vice versa. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I think um, I don't think he thinks about. It. I, I would imagine he doesn't think about it a whole lot. Right. Well, I mean, you know, in his music, he is like you say, he's kind of a motivational speaker of sorts. Yeah. And you know, it's like if I if I can do this, you can do whatever your thing is and follow your fucked up dream or whatever. So yeah. Um, that you know, and, and he he can't be that surprised that somebody like took him at his word and was inspired by his words and you know <laughs> actually went out and followed their fucked up dream or whatever. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, that's, that's a nice way to put it. Um, yeah. I think yeah. I think um. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I, 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 I think any writer worries about how, how you know the things they write will affect the people they write about, mm-hmm. um, and I'm certainly one of those people. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, like the, the book is, I, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so confident that the book comes from a place of of sincere love and affection for him, and um, I just, I. I I don't. I think usually when a, when when someone when a, when, a, when the subject of an article or a book like you know lashes out, it's it's partly because they detected something you know in the author's outlook that that maybe the author was hiding. You know, they like that, that when they read the book, they they realize oh this author like misrepresented himself. You know, or misrepresented how he saw me, um, and that's not what happened here. You know, like mm-hmm. sort of what you I think with the with, with this book it was you know. You, Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think as a result of that, I, I, I did, it didn't it didn't eat me alive as it, as, as I might have uh, expected it would. Mm-hmm. Th- th- that he didn't respond to it all all the way positively. I think I totally understood who Juicebox was and and why he had value when I went on his Instagram and I saw that he had a poster from when he was like 16 years old and he'd done a concert with Wesley Willis and uh-huh. I was like, all right, well it all makes sense now. I get it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> like it all clicked for me. I'm like, all right, uh, you know, there's like they know they're different. They know you know they're different, and they're mm-hmm. just going to be who they are. And, and they're going to you know, be different together. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so, and and but on first blush. There's of course that like regrettable uh, video of him on the you know local television station doing his song that is in totally wrong atmosphere and he's obviously not uh, you know he's not doing his yeah, best. Yeah, like your isn't working. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean in the right context that is a good song, just not in that context. <laughs> yeah, man. If, if you you know if you ever get a chance to see him live and if mm-hmm. your listeners ever get to see him live, it's really. Uh, it's really something else. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, you know, as I say in the book, like, I've had trouble kind of recruiting people into the cult of Juice Box by playing them songs of his, like, on my computer or, my, or, or in the car or whatever. <laughs> but if I bring someone to one of his shows, or, you know, I should say that in the past times, but in the past when I, when I bring someone to one of his shows, you know, they would, they would, they would understand. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, you know, seeing him live, I think, really, uh, you know, it makes it makes clear what, what is special about him and, and, and uh, why he uh, has has such a strong effect on some people like mm-hmm. me. I mean, I think there's only two types of people, just people that don't get it and people who are like, yes, I get it. <laughs> so, um, but okay, so I, I know we got to go because your, your time is, is short and uh, you got to you gotta go keep making those slow burns for me to listen to. So, um, right. but, I got to yeah. go over the, the rough cut of episode four. Yep. I gotta do a little writing on uh, mm-hmm. on one of the other episodes that I haven't written yet. Absolutely. So I'm gonna like you know season three. All right. 
season three. <laughs> I'm already thinking and about you season three. on Twitter. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, I got I got two things I'm thinking about. Of course. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I thought you were. I think you're making the Trump joke, right? Because oh, well, that, that's, that's, that's one of the options. But I've got another okay. option for you. All right. So obviously Trump, but I mean, this might not wrap up by the time it's time for season three. We don't know. We don't know how this is going to go. Um, you could do Trump. That's the obvious. Okay. I think you could also do Andrew Johnson. <laughs> You know, man, the I think, first like, I think president it was too long ago, and there's not enough archival audio, audio to. You could go Ken Burns. There could be some villains <laughs> involved. <laughs> I feel like I feel like the the I, I rely too heavily on archival footage to <laughs> to kind of transport people. Uh, yeah. For for that to work, but uh, it definitely crossed my mind. As a, well, I, you know, the other thing is like we don't want slow burn to just be like an impeach an impeachment show. Uh-huh. So in fact, I think if we can find a, a topic, you know. You know, for a future undertaking in which in which uh, which you know which we, in which we have a story that doesn't turn on an impeachment, um, mm. that would, I think that would be good. Yeah. It'd be good for the brand. Oh, for sure. To, to stretch our like a little bit. But but seriously though, have you thought about Trump for season three? Well, yeah, not not seriously. No, I mean, no. I, I get you know, like I, I, the the tweets make sense. You know, I, I get why people make that joke. Um, but I just think, I, you know, we, we've just been living through this. Like, who wants to, who's going to want to relive it right away? Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like, honestly, I feel like one of the reasons episode, or I mean, season one was successful is that uh-huh. it, it gave people a break from, from Trump. Mm-hmm. And um, it gave people sort of a, a way to process Trump without, you know, hearing his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, obviously, a, a season about Trump would not have that effect. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, check in, check in with me twenty years from now. Maybe, maybe it'll be different, but um, I, I certainly don't have the appetite right now to to uh, to start looking back because um, I just don't feel like we're there yet. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay. Well, hey, I know you got to go. Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, let's let's do it again. And uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's always great great to talk to you. For sure. Uh, have a good night, man. Okay. You too. Later. Bye.
If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to the Rob Burgess Show at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.